Our next talk is called The Geometries of Nonlinear Games, and our speaker is Dave Pickett. After a decade in digital marketing and YouTube, Dave is pivoting to pursue a career in game design. He is currently pursuing an MFA in game design at DePaul University and working on lots of small game projects. He is also the creator of popular YouTube channel Brick101 and co-author of the Lego Animation Book. When he's not building video games or Lego creations, Dave enjoys reading, watching nerdy TV shows, and exploring Chicago with his husband Bert and their dog Sophie. Uh, now, Dave, the, the floor is yours. Enjoy your, uh, your time here today. Thank you. Thank you for that great intro. It's almost like I wrote it myself. Um, so, hi everybody, I'm Dave, and I'm going to be talking about the geometries of nonlinear games. Uh, this is my opening slide. Uh, there's a lot we could talk about right in this opening slide here. Um, if you are following this through Narrowscope in the Discord, I put a link to these slides as well as a link to a live automatically generated transcription um, that is not perfect, but if you want uh, like captions of what I'm doing, that's kind of the best workaround I was able to put in place. So what do I mean when I say the geometries of nonlinear games? Oh, okay, so it's been a weird week in America. Um, and I feel like it would be dishonest to start this talk without addressing that. So I just wanted to briefly plug anti-racism. As a white man, I have benefited from white supremacy, and I think it's important for white people to educate themselves about the history of racism and its current form and shape um, so that you can start to understand the structures, how they operate, um, and then how to dismantle them from within. So these are three things that have been very helpful for me in my own educational journey the new Jim Crow, which is really about uh, the systemic way that the justice system um, is a system of racial control. Notes from No Man's Land by Eula Biss, which is a series of essays that blend the personal and the historical, um, and uh, I think a uh, very uh, different approach, right, than a pure nonfiction. And then The Watchmen on HBO, which is a more totally fictional way. So um, if you're just trying to get into learning about anti-racism, those are like three things I would recommend. Um, also as game designers, I think it's really important for us to think about um, you know, systems, right? Games are an aesthetic form of systems. Um, racism is a system, right? It operates systemically um, and is driven by individuals, but also driven by rules. Um, so it's important to think as game designers, how do we think about exposing the systems that are at play in the world? Um, uh, Bonnie Ruberg calls this, I believe, de-gamification, like exposing the, the game systems that are already uh, present. So this is um, an image of Suffragetto, which is a game that was released in 1908 uh, by the suffrage movement, um, which is about how police and suffragettes uh, clash and try to control opposing territories. Um, obviously, like this is not an equal side forces with equal power is not the current dynamics of our current system. But I think it is important to think about how games have a role to play in talking about systems and helping people understand them. All right, so if that didn't get you off of my talk, now you have earned the right to learn about game shapes, I guess. So I have three points to make today. Um, the first is that games have shapes. Um, maybe you already agree with that and that'll be an easy point. Um, maybe not. The second is that trying to put shapes into words is hard. Or to put another way, shapes words hard. Um, and then the third is actually what you presumably came for, which is to show you the game shapes that I've kind of discovered in games and you know, have come up with some names for, um, which I hope will help other people in the process of making, discussing, and you know, enjoying games. Um, but first, there's a problem. Uh, so part zero, surprise. Um, I, I also wanted this talk to be nonlinear, so I'm going to mess and loop around a little bit. So first, there's a problem. So I first noticed this problem, um, or really crystallized for me, when Super Mario Odyssey came out. 
So Super Mario Odyssey is the latest mainline entry in the Mario franchise, unless you want to count Super Mario Maker 2, but uh, came out a few years ago, and uh, it's a good game, right? Like, there's a lot to enjoy about it, but there was something about the game that I felt when I played it that I didn't like, but I couldn't articulate. Um, and uh, the more I tried to find a way to articulate what I felt, the less I felt like anybody could articulate it. So these are some snippets from reviews of Super Mario Odyssey. Super Mario Odyssey is an effort to return the series to more open world gameplay, like in Super Mario 64. That means it's less linear. Uh, contrast that with the following claim. Claims that Super Mario Odyssey is a modern open world entry in the series are overstated. They're like coming for each other, right? The main campaign keeps Mario on a linear track from Polygon. Um, then we have Odyssey is a 3D Mario in the mold of Super Mario 64. The structure consists of a series of large, discrete, and somewhat open worlds. So we have open world, not open world, somewhat open world, all describing this. Um, and then this one, which I like for a lot of reasons, Odyssey resurfaces a dormant mutation of Mario, only previously seen in full effects in Sunshine and Mario 64. This Mario is defined by open sandbox levels stuffed with secrets and multiple goals that do not necessarily need to be tempted in order which implies that there still is an order, right? But that you don't necessarily need to follow it. Uh, but that sometimes change the context of the level when you complete them. Odyssey expands this structure without fundamentally altering it, right? So all of these are trying to get at what the, there's a, a sense of a shape of the game and whether it's linear or nonlinear is an object of contention, right? If we look at some of the key phrases in there, we have open world, open world is overstated, somewhat open world, open sandbox levels, right? And whether open world and sandbox should be the same, right? We could have a whole conversation about. And we also have less linear, compressed with on a linear track, not necessarily need to be attempted in the same order. So, right, the way that a lot of people talk about linearity um, especially in games, is that there are two things, linear and nonlinear. And, you know, you could use other words here, right? You could say that a series or on rails tries to get across the same sense as linear. And nonlinear is often used in the same breath as the words open world or sandbox. But what's weird is when we're talking about the very concept of linearity and nonlinearity, we just put them on a linear spectrum, right? As if it was just, there's linear things and nonlinear things and somewhere, some fall in between. Um, but could we talk about shapes this way, right? Like, okay, we could say that maybe a circle is the most nonlinear shape and a line, like a long rectangle is a very linear shape and maybe a square falls somewhere in between. And that might make a certain sense, but like if we said a square peg in a round hole versus a partially nonlinear peg in a totally nonlinear hole, right? You can see why like the way that we talk about linearity um, is, is just not super nuanced and is, lacks a lot of specificity um, that might be useful in describing games as you're conceptualizing them or trying to understand them uh, after playing them. Um, and, you know, where would you put a triangle on this spectrum, right? Like, in some ways, a triangle has linear aspects, right? It's got that flat base, which could kind of imply a directionality. Um, but at the, other, at the other time, it's like, it's an equilateral triangle, so it's equal distant from the center. And if you turn the triangle on its side, does it start feeling more linear because it has directionality? Like, what happens as you change that shape? And could a triangle actually, depending on how it's oriented, be across the spectrum? And then of course, like what if we had just totally other shapes here, right? Like some of these, it, it would be weird to even try to put them on a spectrum here. Because right, this is not the way we talk about shapes. Um, because two-dimensionality has a, a, a wide range of 
uh, ways that it is, right? And this is without even getting into a third dimension um, because nonlinear just means it, it is not a line, right? Which just means that it has some aspect that takes it beyond lineness and needs a second dimension. Um, uh, so, right, like if we think of linear means one dimensional and nonlinear means at, at least more than one dimension. But the other thing is that all of these statements about Mario Odyssey are true, right? It's not like people said the wrong thing. It's just that it's a very complex system. Um, so at the broad superstructure, this is a linear game. There are a series of worlds, and they are literally laid out in a line in the menu for you to choose which to go through. And as you play through the game, you go from one kingdom to the next to the next. And it's linear. But each of those worlds is a large space with multiple goals that can be achieved in a variety of orders. Um, and you know some of which um, it's only gated by the number of things you have done as represented by a moon, right? So you could do a bunch of things that would be side questy and still complete enough to leave the level. Um, but there is a very strong linear through line in all of these worlds in a way that wasn't present uh, in Super Mario 64 necessarily, or even Sunshine. Um, there's arrow signs that point you to where you should be going if you want to follow that path. The coins very clearly lead Mario in a direction. There's a very clear sense of a path in a wide open world. And also, there are moons tempting you off of that path um, at all points, trying to draw you back into the world. So again, um, we it's a constant interplay of a linear experience and a very nonlinear experience. And also, there are parts of the level that are gated by a certain number of, uh, by collecting specific moons. So there's a lot going on. Um, there's also the fact that Mario can at any point just choose to teleport to a checkpoint, right? So kind of modern fast travel which is a non-linear form of travel, right? Because we can just look at this map and point to any of those flags and just instantly teleport there, right? That's not something that historically Mario could do, right? And it breaks up the linear experience of exploring a space if you can teleport around it. Um, there's also um, optional collectibles that you can get, um, which are gated by a currency, right? These are non-linear things. So there's, there's a lot going on here. Um, so after, like, really struggling with this problem um, and doing a lot of research, which I'll show you later in the talk, I finally figured out the shape of Super Mario Odyssey. Um, it is a series of jellyfish um, capped off with a descending accordion mountain at the end. And if that sounded like gibberish, um, we're on the same page. But hopefully by the end of this talk, it'll make sense. Um, and Doing a similar in-depth look, um, this is the shape of Super Mario 64 that I have uh, kind of discovered. And this is not something that I just, I drew this as a cute little sketch for this talk, but there is data to support this. So this is a graph of um, the progression shapes of Super Mario 64, Super Mario Galaxy, and Super Mario Galaxy 2. So basically at any point in the game, given how many stars you have, there's a number of stars that you have access to do as your next thing. Um, and that's what this represents. And we'll come back to this later. Um, but um, if we now line up uh, my two shapes for Super Mario 64 versus Odyssey, we see that they, at, a, at the, the highest level, they actually have wildly different structures, right? Super Mario 64 is like a mountain range, whereas, um, you know, Mario Odyssey is much more like, you know, a string of pearls or a bread knife. Um, there's, there's noticeable geometric differences between these progression shapes. Um, and that is, <laughs> this is the picture that answers my question that I had when I first started learning about Mario Odyssey and tried to explain why I didn't like it as much as Mario 64. Um, we could also overlay Super Mario Galaxy here. So Galaxy um, has a much more um, uh, widely used shape. So it is basically an arc that has a little aspect of accordion. 
Um, and so if we were add to just put some side quests on there, this would basically, I argue, be the shape that most AAA titles um, launched in like this decade kind of look like. Um, you start with a few options, and then as you progress throughout the game, you get progressively more options, and then you probably get to an ending, but then there's a lot of content that you could kind of grind out until you finally deplete the game. Um, and there's random side things that you could do as well. Um, but if we zoom out here, we can see that that jellyfish in a series is actually just Super Mario Odyssey again. Um, so if this kind of thing is interesting to you, stay around for the talk. Uh, if not, bye. All right, part one. Part one of the talk. Games have shapes. So what does that mean? Tetris. All right, there's shapes in Tetris. That's not what I'm talking about, right? I'm not talking about the actual uh, fact that games are made up of pixels, which, um, you know, therefore mean that there are shapes that exist in a world um, and that those are important. I'm also not talking about um, level design, right? I'm not talking about how we can think of levels as architectural spaces that shape how players move um, and feel and, you know, a hallway versus a plaza, right? That's a whole other line of inquiry that I'm not talking about today. I'm also not talking about Steve Swink's argument about game feel, right? Which um, I would call the, the proprioceptive uh, imaginary of games, right? This idea that when you control an avatar in virtual space, you you, part of your body uh, gets feels what is happening to that avatar. Um, and it is kind of like a projected sense of proprioception, which is your sense of your own body and where it is in space, uh, but that you, you get that for an avatar, avatar, right? That's another way that we could talk about the shape of games. What I am talking about is progression structure. So since this is interactive fiction, um, right, the, we, we have to talk about choose your own adventure, right? I, I, it's, there's a lot to talk about with Choose Co and how they interact with the rest of the games industry, right? But uh, they did make some of these really pretty pictures that show the structure of some of their books. So this, I believe, is Time Cave, right? It's one of the most complicated uh, of the structures. But if we look at this and we know that we're seeing a interactive um, book, you know, that has decision points, we understand, okay, I start at the left, and then every time there's a circle, that's a decision point, and I go one way or the other, and that affects the future choices I have. And at any point, right, I have so many choices ahead of me, and I'm heading towards one branch or another, right? That is a, that is a different sense of shape, right? Because there's not a geometric um, sense that my player is in a hallway, right? My avatar is somewhere. It's just that I, as the player of this experience, have certain options open to me that might widen or narrow depending on the choices I make, that my choices impact my ability to make future choices. Um, and if you follow along with um, the talk using the slides I gave, I put image sources to anything that's not my image. Um, we could also think about how um, Mark Brown from Game Maker's Toolkit uh, in his series on Boss Keys, um, you know, made these really beautiful graphs that show kind of the dependencies of um, item progression in Metroid, or this is um, Castlevania Cynthia, Symphony of the Night. Um, so he has a whole system for locks and keys and showing uh, what parts of the game you're able to access based on what you've done. Um, and I, you know, his work was definitely influential in how I have been thinking about this. Um, and also, if you watched the talk before this, um, we could think about what uh, Nathan Savant was talking about. I just added this slide while I was watching uh, his talk because it was so relevant and amazing. So go watch that talk, and the link should take you to the right Twitch video. Um, and then we could also look at like game theory, right? Mathematically, you know, there are math nerds who have mapped out things like tic-tac-toe and chess and checkers and said, here it is. Here's every possible game of tic-tac-toe. Um, this is not every possible game. It was just an image source that looked cool and got my point across, right? And right, 
I don't know that much about the mathematics of graph theory or game theory. That's not a field I've studied, um, and it's not something that's being taught to me even as I'm learning about game design. Um, but there's a whole uh, jargon and body of knowledge that's there that we could theoretically draw from as we're trying to think about game shapes. Um, and again, the game shapes being kind of the possibility space of games um, and how it affects player experience. So this apparently is called a game tree. Um, and I have this problem with the word tree is that whenever people tell me this is a tree, I'm like, that's not a tree. It's going sideways, right? If you put it like this, then it's much more obvious that it's a tree, right? And it would be easier, like people would understand the terminology better. And so I think it's important whenever we're talking about this thing, uh, any of these shapes that we think about which direction it makes most sense to, to put them in um, and whether our terminology is informing the way we display the shapes or vice versa, um, right? Because if this was a, if we put it this way, it's much more obvious it's a tree and we can think about how, you know, trees in the real world work and what it means to be on a branch um, and you can't really get back to another branch or maybe some branches are close enough you can hop between, right? Like there's all sorts of ways we could think about it and think if tree is really even the right word to use here. Um, uh, and, right, it does kind of look like an abstraction of a tree, right? Because also that diagram I was showing you had way too much information, right? It's not easy to process in a glance, like, what is the shape of this game? But if it was a tree, right, we would just draw it as an oval and a line, that's a tree. Then if we turn that oval sideways again and flatten it out and add some side quests, oh my gosh, it's, it's every modern game again, because all games basically can be derived from this shape, um, which hopefully you'll agree with me at the end of this talk. Where are we? All right, we've only like 52. That's pretty good. All right, part two. Shapes are hard to word. Uh, or words are hard to shape. Shape words. <laughs> um, so now we're going to look at these. And uh, I'm not keeping up with any of the discussion in Twitch or Discord that might be happening. But feel free to try and describe this shape, right? This is a shape in Tetris. And if you were playing Tetris with a partner where one of you was pressing the buttons and one of you was looking at the screen and maybe trying to describe, you might need to be able to describe this shape very quickly, right? And if you were trying to describe the shape to another person so that they knew exactly where you were talking about and there was no confusion, right? How would you describe it, right? We could think of this as a T shape, right? That's, that's how I think of it. But also in this configuration right now, it doesn't look like a T because it's not oriented that way. We could also think of it as a pyramid. Um, right here, it kind of looks like a little person waving high, you know? And depending on the context of why we're talking about this shape, right? Any of those words could be useful. And as long as it communicates the important information to the person we're trying to communicate with, it would be a satisfactory word to describe the shape. Um, and you could play this game with the different Tetris shapes. So like, what is this shape? That shape, right? Just thinking about what you would call this shape. That's the exercise to do along at home. Um, and remembering that some of these shapes are mirrored. So if you used L to describe the last one, or you know the bent piece to describe the mirror of this, um, how would that change when there's two of them? And right here's the T piece again, but in a different angle where it looks more like a pyramid, maybe. Now I come from a background with Lego, um, so that is a system that I know very deeply. Um, that informs a lot of my thinking. Um, and this is applicable to Lego as well, right? Lego is a system of three-dimensional objects which have different ways that they relate to each other, which are, you know, in sense, embodied rules of a system. Um, so we could look at these three Lego pieces, and there's a lot we could know about those Lego pieces based on our knowledge of the Lego system. Um, the one on the left is really interesting because it lets us build sideways if we're building up. 
Um, the one in the middle is not the most interesting because it's a one by one, so it doesn't really ever expand possibilities, but it can be nice for detailing. It's also round, which can be useful for a lot of reasons. The one on the right uh, introduces us to a whole different system, right? So there's a system of clip pieces and bar pieces, which interact with the main Lego system in a different way. Um, and so it's kind of a translation piece. But again, if I'm, and all of these have official names within Lego for production purposes. And all of them have names within the fan community, um, which are slightly different because we disagree on some of the color nomenclature that Lego uses versus what fans use. And also, anyone who's interacting with these pieces might have their own homebrew names for these pieces because this is from a research study of what children call Lego pieces, right? So each of these pieces um, has a variety of words that these kids came up with to describe it, right? So a bent forer or a ladder without steps because it's like air vents, the silver ramp, the six studded clippy piece, right? And you can see how if you're maybe digging in a bin of pieces, looking for a piece and trying to describe what you're looking for to the person who's also playing with you, right? As long as you get across the sense of what you're looking for, it's fine. Um, so this is, this is about me and my relationship with language right now um, in that I never liked the idea of connotation versus denotation and that there's like a correct word that has a set meaning, right? I've always been much more thesaurus-driven thesaurus and connotation-heavy. So I definitely aim for a plurality of vocabulary over um, like a strict taxonomy of vocabulary. So that's the approach I'm going to take to game shapes. So if we look at Super Mario Odyssey again, right, this is a shape. And there's lots of different words we could use to describe that shape. I've already used some of them. Um, we could call it kind of like a bread knife, because actually those parts that I made kind of round should actually be a little more jagged, so it should kind of look more like a serrated knife. Uh, we could call it a centipede, right? It kind of has little legs, and that kind of gets across this feeling of segments. Um, we could call it eight foot hills in a mountain, right? To, to get a sense across that sense of scale and how different parts of it uh, are different. And then also it literally tells us exactly how many foothills there are. And, and eight foothills is not necessarily the right number. This was literally a sketch I did from my brain. Thinking about Odyssey, it was not a detailed study. Um, so, you know, kind of recapping what I was just saying, languages are systems. Lego is a system, and therefore Lego is a language, right? That, to me, is just true, and right? Then we think about how do we translate between a shape language and a word language. So games are languages too, right? Games have their own languages that are created by the way all of their parts interact. So games speak. And one way games speak is through shapes. And sometimes those shapes are actual uh, geographical architectural shapes. But what I'm talking about is the shape of player choice. Shape words. <laughs> so if we have shape words, then we also theoretically will have shape phrases. And hopefully this will bring us all back around to the beginning and you'll understand all these crazy diagrams I've been drawing for the last few years. All right, so here's the part where I show you the game shapes. Uh, so hopefully this is worth the wait. So this is um, what I of shapes to describe most progression experiences in games is. Um, so, right, I, I feel really confident that I've covered a lot of territory with these, and I'll explain why. Um, and, you know, all of this builds, obviously, on the work of many other people who have tried to uh, show the shapes of games, right? As soon as I posted the link to the slides in Discord, people were already referencing, you know, M Short and um, other people who have done work shaping out specifically interactive narrative shapes. And, um, you know, I think the interactive fiction community is actually way far ahead of the, like, action game side of game dev in thinking about game shapes. Um, I think because it's one of the main ways that interactive fiction has to like 
to control player experience and feel, um, right? We don't necessarily have um, a sense of architectural space in um, a purely text-based work. Um, you obviously can, right? Like that is true, but this progression sense is something that is, you know, kind of it inevitably in in choice based games. I don't know if that makes sense, but these are the shapes. Let's go through them. A line, right? This seems like the most basic shape. Um, what is a line? Just talking mathematically, it is a connection of two points, and that is really all a line is. Um, but a line is a really efficient, great way to communicate, right? If I want, if I'm starting here and ending here, there's a way to get there, right? This goes back to just thinking of beginning and middle, right? This is a story structure, right? There's a reason why stories are linear because it's just an efficient way to, um, you know, present information, uh, especially because of how time works being linear. Um, but this is also just one, one line, right? There are many types of lines. And there's also many words we could use to describe what this is, right? Line is what I'm calling it, but it could also be an edge if we're getting into mathematics deeper. It could be a path. If we think of in the woods, walking on down a track or a trail, it could also be a route, right? Um, it could be a series, right? We could get into the sense that there's really an ordered set of points um, or, or, or even journey, right? If we think three-dimensionally about a very direct line. The game journey is an amazing study in how to motivate and communicate that to a player, right? The sense that you're just going up a mountain, right? And you're always going towards the mountain and like that is the end and wherever you are is the beginning, right? And you have a sense of that, that line the whole time you're playing. Um, so games that communicate linearity um, really well can be really good. Um, I, linear games were also an invention. Um, when Super Mario Brothers came on, right, it was notable for its linear story and progression. The fact that you went somewhere, uh, rather than most arcade games at that place, which were just kind of like endless loops and often had very open things. Like if you think about Asteroids, Asteroids was an open world game. There's a bunch of asteroids. You can choose which ones to shoot um, and it's just get rid of all of them. So linearity was actually an invention. Right? We, we talk about open worlds as something that's new. Open world is actually more where games, video games specifically, started. And then like there was a linear phase because, you know, Miyamoto and many other reasons. Um, so lines are actually really good and you should never feel bad for making something linear because they're actually super radical in a lot of ways. Um, but lines don't have to be just a straight flat line, right? We can think about what does it feel like if a line is curved? What if it's angular, right? This draws to, like, thinks of, like, a Google, Google Maps series of turns and directions and how that feels, even though I'm still always going to one place. Um, we could also play with the geometries here and, like, what if um, this screen actually wrapped around um, and so the line leaves it but then comes back. There's lots of different ways, or a line that's actually a circle that keeps hitting itself and never ends, right? All of these are lines that you could explore with a game shape that would all have vastly different feels, even though that they were all just a series of events happening, right? Or a series of game scenes. So line, like, I feel like linear is often used as a pejorative, uh, like, oh, that game's so linear, blah. Uh, when linear is actually super cool and don't let anybody shame you for being linear. All right. So then the next thing I want to talk about is a warp. So this is the idea that there is a line, right? There's a linear story that happens, but there are ways to skip huge sections of that story. But you don't get any new content by doing that, right? You're just literally going from, you know, level 1-2 to level 4-1, right? To use the Super Mario Brothers example. You're just literally skipping a whole bunch of stuff. So when I think of this, I think of warp is the terminology I would use that's more gamey, but we can also think of that as like a table of contents in a book, right? The affordances of books 
are so baked into us that we don't even notice how nonlinear page numbers and tables of contents are, right? Fast travel in modern games, uh, a portal, right? Connecting two spaces in time. This is also a wrinkle in time, the whole concept of being able to fold two spit points in space so they're next to each other when they wouldn't otherwise be next to each other. Um, I also could think about like fast forwarding on a VHS tape or scene selection on a DVD, right? All of those things basically do the same thing as a warp in a video game. They connect two points that weren't otherwise connected. And so if we look at the superstructure of Super Mario Brothers 1, it is basically a line. Um, there are, you know, uh, four times eight, 32, 32 levels. Uh, and they happen in sequence, one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, two, one, two, two, right? But there are a few points where if you know a secret, you can skip levels. Um, and so we could show that as a series of dotted lines, right? I'm doing a curved dotted line because I feel like it's a very different feel than a straight line, um, right? It's not, you're not really doing anything. It's just that there is magically a way that these places connect and like, really like it kind of goes beyond what is possible in one dimension. So, but again, we could think about non-Euclidean geometries that would make a line able to touch itself at different points, things like that. All right, so the third game shape um, is this, which is a branch, right? Or I don't know, branch is maybe not the right word here. So this I would call a cul-de-sac. So this is the idea of like you, you are in a maze and you turn down a corner and then it is a dead end, right? You're trying to get to the end of the maze. And so there is a clear place that you started the maze and you know that there's a way out. And so if you go down a path and it doesn't get you out, it did not get you closer to your goal. Um, so there is a sense that it is, it is not along the line, um, but it is part of your experience. Um, so again, doing kind of a plurality of terminology here, right? This could be a cul-de-sac, a dead end. This could be a side quest. This could be the bad ending. This could be the wrong way. We could have a one-up or a secret hidden at the end. A lot of games do that now where there will be a thing that doesn't really get you closer to your main goal, but then there's a reward there because um, designers are afraid of you ever feeling like your time wasn't valuable these days. Um, this is often how toad houses are handled in mainline Mario games, that they're never necessary to your quest. Um, they're just kind of like a random side tangent that may reward you at a larger sense, but doesn't physically you know, change your uh, amount of choices and progression in the game. Um, okay, so this shape um, I'm going to call the detour. So this is the sense that, and you might be asking yourself, how is this different than the warp? So this is that there is a main path, right? There's a line at the bottom. That's always the way we could go. But at some point, there is another way I could go, right? And maybe that way is slightly faster or slightly harder or easier. It's just another way. And there is content there that I experience that means that I miss out on some other content, right? Like when I choose to go up that line, I'm missing out of what's ever on the bottom and vice versa, right? So there's a real sense of I have made a choice and I am experiencing something from that choice, even though I'm eventually going to get to the same place. Um, so detours, right? In the Mario terminology, these are often how bonus rooms are handled. This could be a shortcut. This is basically the experience of... Mario Kart 64, the one Yoshi level, where all the paths go in different ways and you don't know if you're ahead or behind because there's so many different ways to go, even though it all comes back together. Um, I would also call this multi-linear, right? Where like there is a sense that there's lines here. There's just a few of them stacked on top of each other, right? And Sonic the Hedgehog's level design loves to stack a whole bunch of routes one on top of another. Um, Mario doesn't do that a lot, um, but um, you know, various games play with multilinearity in a lot of ways. Um, this also plays in Super Mario World, 
um, as kind of the star world, which lets you skip huge chunks of the game, but also you have content. So it's different than warping where you just like instantaneously go. It's just there's a different path that might be faster or slower. So if we look at World 1-1, one, one, you know, the most overanalyzed game level in all of video game, right, we can see, okay, the bonus room is a detour right? Um, if I go through the bonus room, I skip a chunk of the overworld, um, and, but I still end up at the flagpole. Um, and so this is actually the basic shape of most 2D Mario levels, is that there's a main line, but there's maybe one or two detours along the way. And depending on how those detours intersect with each other or the main level, you can get lots of different feels just from detours. And if we split a detour in, in half, we get two different shapes. Um, which are a mirror image of each other, and whether these count as distinct from um, a detour or not is really at what level you're analyzing the game, right? Whether you're talking about the superstructure or a substructure or um, whatever you're talking about. So um, this is a branch. Sorry, I said branch earlier. But this is when um, there's a line of content and then suddenly something happened that there is now another line of content that is never going to reconnect, right? That is like a crazy open feeling, right? That interactive fiction and like games um, do way better than what we would consider linear media of, you know, like a movie or a novel don't typically have multiple endings. Um, but uh, we could call this a fork. We could call it a branch. We could call it a split. We could call it a secret exit. We could call it the true ending, which would then get us thinking about video game morality and how it moralizes different endings. Um, we could think of this as scope creep, right? If you are writing, um, making a game, and you decide that there's going to be a whole other ending um, or a whole other branch, right? Now you're having to double up some amount of content and know that some amount of players will never see it, right? And so you have the more of these you add the more you're adding to your scope. Um, so the opposite of this is just when paths reconverge. Um, this, I don't think, gets talked about as much, right, in, like, nuanced detail of, right, we, we kind of talk about branching a lot, but kind of the, the reconvergence um, is also a distinct feeling. Um, I would call it a confluence, um, which is, like, when rivers come together, um, but it could also just be an anti-fork. Uh, or a funnel, right, that it's kind of bringing things back together, a convergence. Um, this could also be a secret entrance. So there are some times um, in Super Mario World, there's one time where you there are two different ways you can enter a level. And so you have a slightly different opening experience based on that. That's really rare to see something like that. Um, we could also think of this as scope uncreep, right? If you think about telltale games and how they'll open up something um, as a big decision in one chapter, like who are you going to save from the zombie? But then maybe a chapter or two later, whoever you saved ends up dying also. So like we go back to both of those characters are dead no matter what you did. And while you got a different experience, right, we're, we're protecting the narrative long-term from scope creep by just, you know, dealing with, those, like, kind of tying the loose ends back together. Um, Saikendetsuku 3, which I did not pronounce right, uh, which I think is also now being re-released as Trials of Mana, it's also one of a uh, few games I could think of that actually has wildly different openings based on um, some choices that you make. And I'm sure there's lots of examples I don't know about. I'm not super well-researched in all of this. So this is Super Mario World. Um, so basically, now that we've talked about forks and detours enough, um, I can show you this graph of the first two worlds of Super Mario World, and it should be sensical. Um, and um, I'm going to rush through this because there's only 15 minutes left, and I want to leave time for questions. Um, but I did this for fun. I just went to draw.io, and I mapped out the whole shape of Super Mario World when I was starting to research this. Right, like The reason I'm able to talk about all of this is not because... I was ever officially studying games. I just became obsessed with this idea and started drawing a lot in notebooks and then made graphs so that I understood it. Um, and hopefully, other people find this interesting. But anyway, um, if you've played Super Mario World, there's, you know, I've shown this graph to people and they're like, oh, I can see the star world. I can, 
I can tell where the special world is. Uh, oh, that must be worlds three and four because they're kind of intermingled in a weird way. Um, this is the terrible forest of illusion, which is really hard to map even when you're being really specific about substructures and things like that. Um, and so having a sense of a shape of a game is, I feel like, really important as a designer. So this is something I drew in my second week of grad school for a small Bitsy game I was working on, where I was just trying to map out what the game experience was going to be like and all the stuff I needed to create. And it's like, I don't know how you would even start to build a game without something like that. And so um, I also think this like has implications for like how like designers communicate with the rest of game teams and it, it impacts UI, right? Like, so this is from that same Bitsy game that I'm still working on, even though I started it almost a year ago, um, where I actually put in a scene select that lets you jump to any of the points in the game. Right, because like that's something that books have. That's something that DVDs have. Why don't all games have it? Even if games are nonlinear, like yes, you you can't just do a one 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 selection. You have to think differently. But if you know the shape of your game, then the UI artist, even if that's you being a different person from yourself, which is how I like to think about my different roles on a single game, um, right? It's helpful to be able to map out your game shape. Um, so that you can communicate that to your player. Um, and also, I just implemented this for debugging my own game because I was tired of having to play through everything again just to get to all the weird aspects. So if you create a tool like that for yourself to debug, why wouldn't you give players that level of freedom and control over the work? OK, running out of time. This is Mega Man. Um, so in Mega Man, there are eight robot masters. You can face them in any order. Whenever you beat one of them, then there are seven left. So this is how many things you could do in Mega Man as a function of how many things you've done. You start with eight, and then once you've done one of them, you have seven, and six, and five, and four, and three, and two, and one. Uh, and then there's, there would be a tail at the end. Um, but like these could be literal points, and we could connect these with lines, right? We could say, OK, each of these represents a different robot master. I could draw a line from each of them to the next dot, because there are that many different unique paths through Mega Man we could think about. Um, and I literally took the time to connect all of those dots in the two rows um, just to show that it, it is doable. But then I was just like, y'all get the point, right? The point is that there's a big triangle here. And we can fill the whole thing in because it's so dense with lines, it's easier to talk about a full shape, right? If um, going back to like, uh, math and calculus, we think of the area as representing like all the possibilities in that space because there's so many, as opposed to line graphs, um, that actual dense shapes mean something slightly different. So that's just me filling in more. So I call this a, a decrescendo. Um, I could, you could also think of it of a, of a progress shuffle, right? Because there's a set amount of things to do. Uh, you can do them in any order or a variety of orders, um, but you have to do all of them. Um, this is also an eight red coin challenge in Super Mario 64. There's eight coins scattered about. You can get any one of them first and any one of them last, but you have to get all of them. And so there's a wide variety of ways you can interact with that and choose your own order. But the overall feeling as you go through it is that you have fewer options, right? Because at the beginning, you're overwhelmed with options. And by the end, it's like you're checking off the last chore on your to-do list. It's also just a triangle. So that's another word to describe the shape. And then the opposite of that is obviously right an upwards triangle. So the feeling of like, oh, I'm just starting the game. But like as it opens up, I have more and more options. And any one of them will move me forward towards my goal. Um, so a crescendo of action and possibility, an upwards triangle. Uh, this is when the tutorial is over and the game starts to really open up. Uh, it's also what I would call the good half of the game. Um, so most games have a crescendo and a decrescendo. And I feel like the decrescendo ends up being a chore. Um, so this ties back to why I love Super Mario 64. So this is like just the opening moments of Super Mario 64. It's a huge upwards crescendo. When you get one star, you can suddenly get so many more. And once you get that second star, it unlocks even more. Um, and the game levels out later and eventually decrescendos. Um, but that huge upward momentum is, um, you know, just it's something that's still really rare to find in a game. And I loved it in Super Mario 64, one of my favorite games of all times. Um, but yeah, so this is how I get the sense that most games are a crescendo followed by a decrescendo, right? You start out with a certain number of skills. You, 
you know, you're probably um, uh, kind of stuck in a tutorial and then like there starts to open up and there's lots of different quests you could do. And then at a certain point, you've unlocked all the possibilities and then it's just a matter of like finishing out the content, right? There's, there's only so much content in a game, um, whether this is a game of Pong and this is the possibilities of scores or whether this is Assassin's Creed and this is all the little things you could do. Um, and um, it, it then becomes just a question of where you start or end the game. Um, so again, this is a quick look at how I graphed out 64, Galaxy and Galaxy 2. Um, Super Mario 64 being this jagged mountain peak. Um, Galaxy uh, becomes a very triangular peak. Um, and then Galaxy 2 starts to get towards this arc shape. So you can see how it was evolving over the series, this kind of uh, jellyfish blob. Um, and this is also, if you look at Super Mario 64, there's an upwards, an upper and lower limit of how many stars a player could theoretically have access to at any time based on how much they know and how... Uh, so anyway, there's an upwards and lower bounds of this, so that's why I drew the graph like this. But then also, um, what Nintendo does really well is they end the game well the crescend before the decrescendo. So you can fight Bowser at 60 or 70 stars, even though there's 120. So the experience of the game, uh, in many ways, comes to a peak here, right? And it's the same as like wanting the most pivotal moment in your story to be, you know, uh, at the end, right, right next to the end of Act Three, right before the denouement the decrescendo, right? You want, that's like, that's a really satisfying feeling. Um, and this brings us to our last sense, which is the accordion, which is just the idea that there's different amounts of content that the player can choose whether to opt in or out of, right? So this is the end of Super Mario 64 after you've beat Bowser, but there's a bunch of stars left. You can do it if you want to, but you don't have to and to feel complete. So I call this an accordion. You could also think of it, <clears throat> excuse me, as an unwarp. And whereas warp ex reduces space, this expands space. You can also think of this as not watching the sad part of a movie, right? That's a way that people interact with movie. This is um, skipping a chapter in the book because it's boring. I always skip the desert part of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I'm sorry, that's boring. Uh, this is Champion's Road. This is a secret ending. This is DLC infinitely extending a game, um, right? There was an end, but there's maybe another end, and you can decide whether it's you want to pursue it. And so this hopefully now explains why this is how I drew Super Mario 64. This is how I drew Odyssey, and this is how I drew typical AAA games. Um, and if you wanted to take like one of Mark Brown's graphs and make it look like one of my graphs, all you do is you flip it sideways and then you condense it down like that. So, um, these shapes, right? Like, um, this kind of, I felt like verified a lot of what I was seeing, right? That I could see the shape was still in the shapes he saw. And I'm sure there's lots of ways, um, people could think about this and add to it. Um, I'm not claiming to be an expert here, just somebody who uh, looked at this for a long time. In summary, all games are linear, all games are nonlinear, so is all media. Uh, my name is Dave Pickett. You can email me at dave at prick101.com. I'm looking for freelance work in the games industry or anything. Uh, thank you, and I'll try to take some questions now. Oh, so yeah, thank you for your talk. I was I was very uh, excited to hear that there was somebody who didn't love Mario Odyssey the way that I didn't love Mario Odyssey. But then you said Mario sixty four was one of your favorites, and I was like, ah, I can't I can't be friends with this person. <laughs> That's uh, okay. Mario yeah. Mario Sunshine apologist. Hey, you know, like uh, I I haven't played Sunshine in a long time. I'm sure it has its, its very, own joy. It's very different. From yeah. Mario. It's, uh, yeah. So let's see. Uh, the lots lots of uh, you know as, as we get at the end of uh, a talk lots of like good talk great talk hooray claps um, if you have questions for Dave uh, please put them in the chat and uh, if you can put the word question at the front that would be very helpful uh, picking them out um, hipster angst asks if games are not index media are they database media. I don't know enough about the, that distinction uh, to answer that question. Um, so an index to me, right, it's at the back of a book. 
it has a list of reference points back to the book, whereas a database, all things can interlink and reference each other. Um, so a database kind of contains its relationships in the, the nodes, maybe, as opposed to in one place. Is that the distinction? I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I'm as lost here that uh, my, my normal approach here is, is useless. I mean, we're we're equally lost. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, we, we, until until we get but, more questions, we could discuss what indexes are, right? There's like there's the heat index, right? That tells you about different types of heat. Do this. Oh, okay. Um, we got a question. We're good. We can stop vamping. Uh, question: How do you think games like Animal Crossing can break through the decrescendo to create a game that has replay value with the concept of endless branches and hills? From Philadelphia. Yeah, so I've been playing a lot of Animal Crossing, and um, you know, I think you can already see this in how Nintendo's strategy has been. Um, right, they launched it with a certain amount of content, and with seasonal events, they're adding things that you, if you've been in the series a long time, you might have expected to be there, like um, hedges and bushes. Right, were not there at launch. They got added as a seasonal event. Um, you know, the sense that DLC will add a bunch of content um, very quickly, which then you'll work through. Um, you know, that is that is a common practice across the industry right now is, right, like you just kind of have a schedule that DLC launches and that'll bring a spike of activity, but people will work through it super quickly. Um, you know, for me, Animal Crossing is primarily a game about expression. So I've built myself a regular house, a haunted house, and a museum about the history of games in my Animal Crossing town, because like, I'm just having a good time there. Um, so, right, it's it's a game that is so open and wide open, like some people don't even need more content. Um, the, a sandbox type experience, right, it's hard to even talk about with some of these shapes, but I think there are ways you can. And the new Animal Crossing is like really weird in in the context of the series, right? Because it actually like has a quest structure in it, and then you get the credits, and that's the end of the game, which is really right. unusual. I don't think they've ever done that before. Yeah, and um, so I didn't talk about this too much, but the decrescendo and crescendo, right? That's really gets into um, progress as currency, right? So stars in Super Mario sixty four, uh, but like literal currency in the case of Animal Crossing, and mobile games often have multiple currencies, right? That are all kind of interlinked in complex economic models, right? So, right, they're, they're, these shapes do not also explain everything, but like when you start thinking about progress currency, things that are gated like that, then, right, then you get into, you know, how economic systems work. And there's lots of different ways you could get that currency, but there's still a limit. Uh, and then there's things you could spend it on, um, but maybe not everything. Um, and how the exchange rate of currencies works um, Nook Mile tickets becoming like the player-driven um, model of exchange uh, is also super interesting to think about um, how you can use that to get stuff that you'd otherwise have to just put game hours into. Um, time in the game is also a currency. Uh, and think about games like World of Warcraft, right, which try to keep you in there forever. Um, there's a sense of um, like this ever-extending goalpost um, so, right, like games today often uh, are, are try to be endless, um, which is an yeah, interesting problem. Lifestyle games, um, I think is what they call those. So, Dice Food Lodging is asking about the jellyfish arms of the AAA model. Yes. So, the arms are basically side quest content that doesn't in any way bring you closer to the the, the end of the game. So. If you, um, I'm playing God of War right now, and there's all these little ravens all over the world. Um, and you can uh, hit the ravens, and then you get experience points and, you know, maybe some other little thing. But it doesn't progress the narrative in any way. It's just kind of like a side quest thing. Um, and so anything that kind of comes off the game and doesn't really get you closer to whatever the ultimate goal you have is, the other thing I should say is, right, any game you could probably draw in a variety of ways, depending on what you decide on is the most important path to be the main line. Um, there's a lot I wanted to say that I did not have time for because this is only an hour. Um, but uh, yeah, so the jellyfish arms are just kind of like side quest content that gets unlocked the further you get in the game, but you don't, it doesn't actually unlock more of the game for you. 
All right. Um, I think that great. is all of the all of the questions that we had from Twitch. Unfortunately, I had to refresh the chat partway through because of a uh, uh, Twitch hiccup. Didn't lost the stream for like seven seconds. And yeah. I, uh, I wanted to, there were a bunch of really good follow up book recommendations to your first two slides or so uh, that Great. I wanted to read off at the end. And I'm very sad that I lost all of those. But um, the one that I, well, the one that I threw in chat, which I remember because it was mine, was uh, Anthem, or not Anthem, uh, Citizen by Claudia Rankine. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which is another another good one. Oh, we do have another question from Philadelphia. Uh, have you ever tried working backwards by drawing an elaborate shape and then deciding what those mean to a game? And do you think that this could be a good way to develop new games? So, you know, as I was writing this up, I, I definitely started to have ideas that were influenced by weird shapes I was drawing, right? So when I was talking about lines and I drew that circle, right? I think that's a really, a, a line, a game, a experience that's linear but loops back on itself and then might change as you play through it a second time or at which you could drop into at any point um, is a really interesting idea I think that could be explored. Um, I think I'm still struggling to finish a small game with a few branches. <laughs> um, so I like some of these I'm like, wow, that'd be really cool. Uh, maybe I'll explore it in five years. So. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I think all of these things you can use to inform your work that way. Uh, we're being told that one of the books was White Fragility by Robin DeAngelo. I've heard really good things about that. That's on my reading list, but I haven't read it, so I yeah. didn't feel comfortable recommending that. Dice Food Lodging uh, asks a follow-up question. Do you have any commentary regarding the cul-de-sacs related to an EXP grind? Yeah. So, I've been playing Final Fantasy. I've been doing a lot of that in that very first yeah. original. Yeah. So the other thing I wanted to say about when you're thinking about what's the through line of the game, right? For Mario, it's easy. It's levels and, you know, stars as kind of an abstraction of levels. But for a lot of, yeah, RPGs, the through line is actually the level of your character. Um, in a lot of ways, that's the primary way that the player grows throughout the game. Um, and yes, there are quests that also have their own dependencies. But, and this is where you would really get into three-dimensional graphs, and you might have quest structures going in one direction and the player's experience points going in another direction, right? Because some quests might not be possible. They might be literally gated by experience, like your level, like, uh, or they might just be unrealistic until you're at a certain level. Um, and so that's where you would get to see shapes where you could go so far in this quest uh, up to level five, but then it would stop until you got to level 10 over here. And it's hard to even draw and talk about three-dimensional graphs, right? Just generally. Um, but like you could start to imagine these shapes. And there are people who have done three-dimensional modeling of progress shapes. Like I think Will Wright did it for The Sims, where it's like money, social influence, and stuff like that. And then he mapped the way that most players go, even though technically this whole cube is a space they could explore most players follow this kind of linear upward progression. They might veer in one direction for a little while, but then when you aggregate them, it becomes maybe like a wide line, but not like a dramatically different shape. It's really interesting, especially what you were saying about you know, currency-based uh, stuff in Animal Crossing, because uh, the, the grinding that I've been doing in my playthrough of Final Fantasy I was entirely for money. Like I could have gone and done the quests at the level, but... I needed to buy like 15,000 gil worth of gear to stay yep. current. So the grind was for cash and it just took forever. I mean, it, it took like an hour. It felt like forever though. So yeah, it was like another no. limit. So it was like the, the two streams of what you've done, the, the past two questions have, have combined for me in my head now. No, I, I, um, I, when I went back and replayed the original Legend of Zelda, I ended up doing a lot of grinding for money just because I didn't get the, the uh, right. sufficient number of rupees to buy the stuff I wanted by playing through the game normally, which is not really a problem in modern Zelda games, right? They right. kind of reduce that grinding necessity. You don't need a lot of money. In the, I mean, I guess in the Breath of the Wild, money is very hard to come by, but in general right. and there's all yeah. right like we could talk about breath of the wilds uh extensively yeah, right it's, it's very <laughs> uh, 
it's very open, right? Like, um, so again, it would be three dimensional, right? The jellyfish would become more um, three dimensionally jellyfish, right. um, but it also starts with a very after those four initial shrines, right? Which you can do in any order. Then kind of the whole world opens up. So there's like a huge jump up that theoretically you could go do anything. But then we could also think about what players are most likely to do and say, you know, if we looked at all the data from all players of the path they traced around the world, it would probably grow out in a few different directions. And we could say, these are the shrines that you're most likely to do in this part. And it would probably end up looking kind of jellyfish again. Yeah. Now that they, they added that patch through DLC, right? They added that patch that shows you your, your path. I wonder if they've been gathering that metadata at Nintendo to see. I'd be really curious. I would love to see a heat map published of the path of every player in Breath of the Wild. Yeah, I, I, think, I think there's so much interesting work that could be done thinking about the, like how players move through game spaces yeah. um, that um, I, I'm certainly not equipped to do most of it. So please, everybody else get inspired and do the work. All right, we got one more question from Twitch chat that I think we should probably move to Discord. Um, okay. But that is from uh, Stabler Meerkat 6 who asks, how, how do you feel the shape of a roguelike game would look like, thinking of something like The Binding of Isaac, which requires the yeah. player to throw themselves at the meat grinder having to finish multiple runs to, quote, finish it narratively. But there is continual yeah. progress in terms of items which unlock new mechanics, etc. So I'm going to like paraphrase Mark Brown from Game Maker's Toolkit here. Um, so he did a, a really good discussion of different types of roguelikes, like roguelikes where you can unlock upgrades, versus roguelikes where you might unlock different random things, but you never really actually um, you know, make the game easier with those unlocks. So Spelunky uh, being something where it never really gets easier, though there are shortcuts later, um, versus Dead Cells where you can actually make the game demonstrably easier. Um, and so if you're thinking about a game like Binding of Isaac, um, where you're maybe not necessarily making the game easier in each playthrough, um, then the thing you're really building throughout your playing of the game is your own knowledge of the game's systems, right? And so, um, right, the the most important, right, like then the levels are not the most interesting thing to map. It's more about how the game becomes easier the more you understand how systems interact um, and the more ver variations you've seen and that, you know, there's a way that yours, there would be a learning curve, right? And the learning curve is probably the most salient curve to map in a roguelike situation. All right. Well, let me say thank you again for your, for your talk and answering all these questions. And if folks have additional inquiries that we can move to the questions and answers channels in our discord um, great yeah i'll uh, pop in there uh now and start uh typing to people so. this is thanks for having me no problem yeah i believe this is the last session of the day for the the day sessions of Meriscope. it's 3 30 here 3 39 um but we've got plenty more programming in the days to come so stay tuned attendees we are not finished yet question mark Right. <laughs> so yeah, have a good have a good evening everybody.